Well, good morning. How are you today? If you're joining us online, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Uh, we are in a series, actually concluding a series, Healthy Inside and Out, and uh, excited about what God's doing in this series, also what he's going to do in the series uh, we're starting next week, which is Time to Dream Again. That's, uh, I think it is that time. It's time as things start shifting here uh, with all the things going on in our, in our personal lives as well as around us in our, in our community, in our country. This is, this is that time. So we're going to encourage you to be doing that. But today we're going to be talking about healthy on the inside out. What if you were to take the entire world's population, over 7 billion people, and just condense that down to 100 people? Uh, what would that look like? You know, if it was just like a hundred of you right here, take all of the world's population, condense it into a hundred people. Well, the world's population condensed into a hundred people, 70 of you would not know the Lord. And 70 of you would not know Christ. 30% would say, yeah, we're Christians. 30 would be white. 70 would be people of color. 51 women, 49 men, that's kind of out of balance, isn't it? So if you're a, a single gal and you're looking for a guy, this, this could be working against you maybe. I don't know. Uh, 80% or 80 of you would live in substandard housing. It would mean that you wouldn't have electricity or you wouldn't have uh, running water or you wouldn't have a proper roof over your head. 80 of you out of 100. 25 would have malnourishment malnourishment. 25 of you. You may have a meal a day, but it would be way, way less than you would need to be properly nursed. In fact, 22% of the children uh, in the world that are younger than five are, quote, stunted. In other words, they are, they're, they're not, they haven't grown fully because of malnourishment and repeated infection, infections, those kinds of things. Two out uh, two, every, every second die, and many of those are children, children under the age of 10, again, because they of malnourishment and, um, and other substandard things. Uh, then 70 of you cannot read at all. 70. Isn't that, sh it's, it's shocking. I mean, now if you travel a lot outside of um, golden zone areas. Most people, when they travel, if they do cruises or they go to certain cities, they stay, Americans stay generally in nicer areas. And so we're really not exposed to the world at large. But the, if you travel outside of those areas, you'll, you'll know this is to be true. And then six have over half of the world's wealth. Out of that hundred, six have half of the world's wealth. All six live in the United States of America. So you may not know that. That may be new information for you. But that's, that's some of the inequities that happens in the world. Now, if you were to, so that's the six or this people who live in the United States. That's us. So how do we actually spend? Here we have all of this wealth. How does the average American spend that wealth? Well, if you... Uh, if this dollar represented how we spent, how the average American spent their wealth, uh, then uh, the, a big chunk of it, almost a quarter of it, 24%, is for our house. Not just the house payment, but all of the maintenance that goes into a house. If you have a pool, it pays for the chlorine for the pool. Uh, if you have a lawn, it makes sure the lawnmower is purring nicely, all the things that go into that. That's how we would, uh, the average American would spend it. Then another 19% would go towards health. This would be uh, your premium or your co-pays or whatever you pay for your health insurance, as well as uh, prescriptions, uh, other remedies that you might need, NyQuil, and all the things that go into your, your health then 22% is for recreation and personal needs. 22%, quite a bit. So you have house and health and stuff and then stomach. You have 15% is for the things that we, you know, consume, eat, and enjoy life and all of our stomachs. Well, that's not, that's not all of it, right? There's still a ride, 
We need to get around. Got to look good doing it. And so 17% goes towards our, you know, or being mobile and getting around and, and then also the insurance and gas, the things in order to do for that. So that leaves 2 to 3%. Now, the average American, if you're, if you're not a churchgoer, the average American gives about 2% of their income towards, <clears throat> towards you know, different uh, charitable organizations. If you're a Christian, if you consider yourself a Christian, you give around 3%. Three percent. So that's how uh, that's how that's spent. Now, would it be reasonable for uh, out of that hundred, uh, if you're a father who represents one of those kids that's dying from mal- malnourishment, to kind of look over at one of the six and say, "Hey, could you help me a little bit? My son will die without help." Uh, probably would. However, most Americans wouldn't be able to help because it's all been. Spent. In fact, it's, this is not even enough. Most Americans have a whole bunch of debt, not just their house, consumer debt, household debt. The, the debt to uh, income ratio is actually over 100% for a lot of people. In other words, if you sold everything that you had and you paid off all your debts, you'd still be in debt. In fact, in Virginia, Virginia's, if you look at the Federal Reserve uh, go on their site, you'll see that Virginians actually have the highest debt to income ratio. In other words, they're, they have more indebtedness than any other state. There's a, actually, there's two other states that are equal, but no state that has more than Virginians. So Jerome Powell, Federal Reserve Chair, <clears throat> said just a few months ago, September of, 2000, uh, of 2020, that consumer indebtedness has raised 4.7%. Now it's $4.2 trillion, and that's been going on way before COVID. Just consumer debt, more debt, this is not enough. And then, of course, our country has $28 trillion of indebtedness. So this just keeps going on and on. Until somebody finally looks at the numbers and said, you know, enough is enough. And when will it stop? Unless it stops with you. You have to just decide, if I'm going to live out my values of what I believe God, how, how God wants me to spend my money, my time, my energy, all those things. I can't just get swept up in what the world does and how the world spends their money. And so here we have this enormous amount of responsibility. We, 80% of the world lives in substandard housing. 25% malnourished. 70% don't know the Lord. And so there are these other things that we are called to be part of. You know, to, when, here at Vineyard, that's one of the reasons, if you're new with us, we believe in generosity. We don't want to just be like the world and spend it on those kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with those things, but we don't want all of our income consumed in that area and then indebtedness and all the things that go just because we can't get enough with that. And so we fund things like our food pantry. We've done that from day one. This church is uh, almost coming up on 30 years you know, ago. We started it. We've had a, a food pantry caring for uh, people that, are, that, that, that can't feed them, that need extra help. We also go out into the community with part of our food pantry. It's called the, the True Bread, where we go and we not only bring food but other supplies into low-income areas. Many of you are, have been part of that. We go to uh, Mazatlan, that's one of our works, our missions. We go into some of the poorest areas, serving the poorest of the poor of the world, bringing them supplies, bringing them medical care, bringing them food, giving them a hot meal that's nutritious. And we partner with other vineyards throughout the United States to, so that they have year-round care. There's a lot of things that we can do, but we have to decide up front, I'm not going to just live, you know, like the world lives. <clears throat> I love this verse here. It says, for we must always cherish the words of our Lord Jesus who taught. Now, this is not in the Gospels. We wouldn't know Jesus said this unless Luke had told us in Acts. And he says, giving brings, Jesus says, giving brings a far greater blessing than receiving. Christian, do you believe that? That giving is where there's a greater source of blessing to us than than, than directly receiving. 
How is that? Well, let's look at this. Four ways. Four ways that happens. Four ways we benefit when we decide to be a giver. <clears throat> One is giving breaks the grip of materialism. There's no secret that we live in a culture that is gripped with materialism. That's what we just talked about. That was kind of my opening to show how we've gotten swept up into that. You know, that it's just about getting and, and believing it. And, and it's really reinforced through advertisers on TV and on the internet that, that you know, we find happiness through getting. You know, I can, it's almost like an American right. Life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. You know, I, I, I deserve to be happy and I'll buy it if that's what's necessary. <clears throat> and that's materialism. So when we give, that giving is really the only thing that breaks the grip of materialism in our lives. Every time we give, that is a spiritual victory. It's a spiritual victory in our lives. Now you say, well, can I just save and not be materialistic? Well, no, saving, there's people that save that are just as materialistic as people that spend. The quintessential person, I think, that demonstrates that is Hetty Green. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She lived about 100 years ago. Hetty Green actually made it into the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's greatest miser. In 1865, her father, her aunt, died, leaving her $10 million dollars. Through shrewd management, she ended up increasing that to a hundred mil, million dollars, which is an equivalent of over three billion dollars today. And yet, she was very miserly with with. She had all that money. She would never turn the heat on in her in her own house. She only owned one black dress that she wore day after day, and all of her undergarments. One, she didn't want to spend any until it wore out. Then she would get another one. She ate mostly just cold pies and cold oatmeal. She bought broken cookies for her kids because they were discounted. One time she spent an entire evening looking for a two-cent stamp that she, had that she had misplaced in her house. Her son Ned, when he was young, was sledding, cut his leg, and got an infection. She tried to bring him into a free clinic because she didn't want to pay to take him to the hospital. And they recognized her. They sent her away. They said, no, you can afford something. You know, you don't need to use the free clinic. She refused to get help for him. It ended up getting gangrene, and his leg was amputated. When she was older, she had a bad hernia. The surgery was $150. She refused to spend it. And then she ended up dying with an estimated value of $150 million, making her the richest woman in the world at that time, but also the most materialistic. You see, if you're, even if you have a lot of money, but you're living in a shack and you're living with this miserly attitude that you've gotten sucked in just as much to materialism as somebody who spends and spends and spends. It's interesting, Hetty's daughter, Sylvia, lived a very generous life because she inherited the green fortune and she, throughout her life, she went ahead and gave and gave and gave to uh, 64 different charitable organizations, many of them churches. By the time she died, she'd given 99% of the money away, lived a totally different life. See, Jesus said this, you cannot serve both God and money. And so that, what he's saying is you have to make a fundamental decision is, is what is number one in my life? I, either God is going to be number one and that will drive all of my decisions or money will be number one and that will drive those different decisions that would come from that. Here he says, command those who are rich. Now we just looked at that. Uh, if you take the world and you condense it into 100, six of them have half of the world's wealth and all of them are in the United States. So that would mean if you live in the United States, that's you, that's me, in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So I love that. He's saying, God says, I want you to enjoy things in life. I want you to enjoy things. That's part of the reason God blesses us with material things. He goes, I want you to enjoy it, but it doesn't end with that. It's not just our own enjoyment. Notice it goes on. Command them to be generous 
and willing to share. So it's both of those words, for my enjoyment, to share. You see, we often, we find ourselves spending our money like we just looked at, going into debt, and then we find ourselves praying, God, I need more. I need more money. Bless me, because I, you know, but we're, we're not really spending it in such a way where we can be blessable, where we are, are enjoying what we have, but we're also positioning ourselves to be in a place where we can share. In this way, they may take hold of the life that is truly life. That's why here at Vineyard, we are all about being generous. When the world gives 2 or 3% and we tithe and give 10%, we are breaking the grip of materialism in our own lives. And we really are demonstrating you know, this attitude of generosity in a sea of selfishness. Second part. Second one is, is giving strengthens my faith. Often, we pray, Lord, grow my faith. I want to have more faith. That's a, that's a desire for us. How does that happen? Well, part of that is tied with how we operate in this area of, of our finances. It all comes down to the question, can God be trusted with my finances? There's clear promises connected. There's no ambiguity. Clear promises. You, God says, you do this. I'm going to come through. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. The, the issue is, is, can we really trust that? Can God be counted on to keep his promises? Can I believe God? Yeah, I, I don't know if you're familiar with David Copperfield. I think most of us are, right? Really well-known magician, illusionist. Well, a few years ago, he was down in West Palm Beach doing a show, and he was robbed at gunpoint. Somebody said, give me, you know, your wallet. So he went to get his wallet, which was in his pocket. But every time he pulled out his, his hands, it was like it was disappeared, right? He, he was interviewed after the fact. He said, well, I just, you know, that's what I do for a living. And I'm good at working under pressure. You know, he called it reverse pickpocketing, you know, because the guy kept going, well, let, let me see your other pocket. And he'd pull out his other pocket. And you, you never, so the guy ended up walking away. And David Copperfield went ahead, had his cell phone that he didn't have to give because he hid it, and then called up. The guys were caught right away. What I think is interesting is, is I think sometimes we see ourselves as illusionists with God. You know, God says, well, I, you know, the, I want you to give towards, you know, helping the poor, towards advancing the gospel. And we, you know, we're like illusionists. Well, God, I don't have any, see, you know, and well, we really do, but you know, we're trying to get away with something or something, it says your giving proves the reality of your faith. How do you know? I mean, I think it's incredible that people will entrust God with their salvation. they say, God, I'm going to trust that you will, you know, you'll take care of my eternity, but I don't trust you with my job. I don't trust you with, you know, my marriage. I don't trust you with my, with my, with my money. I I think sometimes people just have like, it's almost like, a, uh, you know, like cirro cirrhosis of the giver, you know, when it comes to giving, they stop at nothing, you know, here, notice this verse, I love this, it says, let giving flow from your heart, he says, really, giving comes down to a heart issue, a heart issue, it, like our faith, he says, not from a sense of religious duty, now, some of you, that is why you give, and let me just say, I would hope that you would change that around. Relook at why, why am I giving? If it's just out of a sense of religious duty, the Bible says you shouldn't be given for that reason. You shouldn't be given for that reason. You should come out of your heart. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving, all because God loves hilarious generosity. Some translations say cheerful givers, but the Greek word is a hilarion. It actually is where this word hilarious comes from. In other words, out of joyfulness. If you're new with us here at Vineyard, you may not realize, but what a lot of times people will say, our number one comment in, uh, when people join our church is, is I love how, how happy everybody is here, how kind they are. You know, they go out of their way to serve. That. And I want to let you know the reason is because we get it. We want to be generous. We're not going to just take our cues from the culture that's around us. And then it our leaders are generous, our dream teamers are generous, and it just 
It just starts to saturate our whole church body. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of everything. There's that promise. See, there's plenty of promises. Can we prove our faith? Can we stand with that and trust that God will protect us? Every moment in every way, he will make you overflow with an abundance of every good thing you do. Now, from if you're a Christ follower, over, over the years, there will be seasons, there will be times when you'll be called to give above what you normally give. Sometimes way above. I mean, it's just, it, you'll just, God will do something in your heart. You'll get it. You'll say, I want to be part of that. I want to sow into something that's bigger than, uh, than, than me and, and makes, it, it makes an eternal impact in people. Our church is, as you know, if you're part of Vineyard, we love sharing the gospel. We love getting people activated, having them find freedom and to uh, discover their purpose, to make a difference. A lot of that happens in uh, our growth track and then in Dream Team Central that's upstairs. And when we're processing people through, as people are looking to discover how God made them get free, all those things, one of the challenges they have is that they, they can't get upstairs. I mean, we have programming. We have things that we have our youth upstairs. We have um, the reception hall upstairs. We have our Dream Team Central upstairs. We have some offices up there when people come for uh, counseling or some kind of need throughout the week. And older people, people that have some kind of physical disability find it very difficult to get up the stairs. You see, when we Sharon and I started this church uh, in our home, and then we went to some schools, met at the Cinema Cafe. All that was about seven and a half years. And then God opened up this building, which was just a, a racquetball facility. And that was one of those seasons when people said, you know what, we're going to give above where we're normally at in order to help advance that vision, make that vision come quicker. And so we ended up buying this building, but it wasn't very usable for a facility. So a few years after that, we were debt-free. We decided, hey, let's add a renovation, you know, renovate this place to, to what it is today. Three and a half million dollars. People contributed generously. And that's been, you know, the, the, we're still debt-free. That was paid for. But one thing that didn't quite make it, because we just didn't have enough money, was we needed an elevator. And so we have a place for it because the architectural plans said, okay, well, the best place is right when you come in next to the cafe, there's that water wall, and then there's that, that, that enclave there. That, there's a little sign there that actually says, future home of the elevator. And we are needing that. Two months ago, we had somebody in our membership class. I didn't know she couldn't make it up the stairs. And uh, where we do part of our membership class, I mean, they, they, come, they come up there, they meet the, some of the ministry leaders. So at the end, I said, okay, well, it's time to go up. And then somebody whispered in my ear, they said, Pastor, she can't make it up the stairs. And well, then I just felt horribly, you know, I f felt bad. I felt embarrassed. And so I went up and talked to our leaders. I said, hey, when, um, when everybody comes up in a few minutes, can, can you, after you meet with them, can you come down? We have somebody who can't make it up. So I went back down, and it turns out nobody wanted to go upstairs. They kind of heard what was going on, and in solidarity, they just stood with her. I thought, or sat with her. I thought that was great. However, she still, she, she stayed for that day, but she didn't come back afterwards. And I can understand. I mean, that's, that's hard to kind of know that that's our check-in. She just, you know, we can do better. And I, so I, you know, we have a number of people that have the gift of giving that have been contributing towards our elevator. It's $160,000. It's a lot of money to put an elevator in. We, as of today, have $117,774. So that's quite a bit. So we need $42,000. $42,000. And so I'm just casting that vision. I don't want to make you feel like you're under pressure. But it just so happens that many of you will be getting a $1,400 check soon. <laughs> and I wanted to get in there before, as you're thinking about how should I spend that, I want to encourage you to consider to invest that in, in, in 
other people's spiritual journey. I'm going to commit mine. I know you have to make a certain threshold to get that. I, I clear that, no problem. And, and, and listen, if you need that money, you're in a difficult place. Take that, that, I'm glad you're getting that money. That money's for you to spend and do what you need to do. But for a number of you, it is not that situation. You, you don't need the money. And that is going to be an extra $1,400. And I'm going to challenge you. Would you at least pray about it? Pray, God, is this how I'm supposed to spend my money? And I want you to know my money is going there, all of it. Because I would never ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. It will make a difference. We can do this. $42,000 is very achievable. Some of you can give above that. How do you give? Well, it's a little harder, right, with, with, without checks. Back in the day, you could just put it in the memo, you know, because we need to know it's designated for that. You can obviously do a check if you still do checks. Many of us, most of us are giving electronically. The easiest way to do it is through our website. Through our website, if you go there, at the very top right, it says give online. It'll take you to this page right off the bat. And then there, you'll see there it says capital projects. That is our elevator, capital projects. And then you give towards that. If you do it through texting, I did that. I was playing around with it yesterday. It's actually six different steps to get there. So you, it's, you can do it. It actually ends up taking you to the same place eventually. But this is the easiest way to give. Uh, any way you want to, we would love to have, you, you know, you helping us advance that vision. All right. So giving, when we give, it breaks the grip of materialism. It strengthens my faith. It's also an investment for eternity. There, there is, when we give towards the furthering of the gospel, when we sow into people's lives for Jesus' sake, he says that is actually uh, something that happens. We, we affect our eternity. He says, use your money to do good. Always be ready to share with others whatever God has given you. By doing this, you will be storing up. So now he starts to make a distinction. If You may not know this, but there's, there's real treasure. There's earthly treasure, which is treasure. But he goes, then there's lasting treasure, a real treasure for yourselves in heaven. It is the only safe investment for eternity. So there is a way to invest in eternity. And what's remarkable is most investments have a certain amount of risk associated with them. He says, no, it's risk-free. When we give to, in, for, the, for the sake of the gospel, for the furtherance of, uh, of, of what God's doing on, on this earth, he goes, it's an investment in eternity, and you will be living a fruitful life down here as well. So each of us, we have an account with our name on it. And every time you do something as small as giving a cold cup of water, Jesus says, to somebody who's thirsty, he goes, it gets recorded and it gets rewarded. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. That's a banking term. Because you have an account. You have an account and different... Uh, Different verse here says, but though I appreciate your gifts, what makes me happiest is the well-earned reward, the well-earned reward that you will have because of your kindness. It says, it is not that I just want to receive gifts, rather I want to see profit added to your account. Different translation. See, you accumulate interest. There's a profit. It's actually a banking term, accumulated interest. If you go to your banker this week or your credit union, you say, uh, how much interest have I made over the last year? Your, your bank manager or whoever you're talking to is probably going to say, well, uh, well, how much have you have deposited? That's how we can figure that out. If we go, well, I haven't made any deposits. He's going to go, okay, wait a minute. Mr. Mead, let me explain something to you. Interest is connected to how much you deposit. If you don't deposit anything, you don't get anything. And so the, God says, no, there's actually profit added to your account, there's, it grows in interest. In fact, Jesus said at one point, he said, if you give towards the further end of the gospel, you get a hundredfold. Hundredfold, I don't know if you know what that is. That's 10,000% interest. I don't know of any bank that gives 10,000% interest risk-free. And if you hear that, let me know. I want to know about that. But God says that's, he goes, when you give like that, it, it changes things. And then lastly is it makes me happy. And if you're a giver, you know that. 
you know it's more than just endorphins. You know there's something that resonates because you're congruent with your values and what God is doing. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit convicts us when we sin, but when we're doing his will, there is a peace. There is a joy that rises up in our, in our, in our soul. And that's, what's, that, that's what happens. You know, I mentioned Hetty Green to you earlier about that, you know, that miser. She was actually known because she, she was always up in New York and, 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 and Wall Street. She was known as the witch of Wall Street because she was always so upset, always so miserly and miserable. Her daughter, though, was, as I mentioned, Sylvia, because she was a giver, was known for her joyfulness. Listen, there's takers and there's givers in this world. You have to decide what you're going to be. If you get swept up into the culture around us, you could easily find yourself a taker. And takers, they, they hold, they're, they're, they're looking for happiness, but it's elusive. It never happens in their life because, as Jesus said, we started with this verse, there is more happiness in giving than receiving. That's true. And it's tested every day of our lives when we decide, when the Holy Spirit puts on, on our mind, on our heart, I want you to go this way. And then there's the flesh part of us that goes, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I don't know if I trust you enough. enough. And God says, I want you to grow in your faith. I want, to pr- I want you to prove the earnestness of your faith says, the people rejoiced for they had given freely and wholeheartedly. That's why we give. Not under compulsion. We say that all the time around here at Vineyard. You give what God is telling you to give. Don't give because of me. Please don't. Absolutely. Give because God is telling you to give. Give freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. And David also rejoiced. Last verse, the heart regulates the hands in giving. For a Christ follower, see, it's all about a change of heart. When God gets a hold of our heart, everything else flows naturally. It becomes easier. Walking out the Christian life out of religious duty is difficult. I personally think Christianity is probably one of the most, if not the most challenging religion to follow of all, if you're just doing it out of religious duty. But when you do, when you do it out of the heart, when you let the Lord get a hold of your heart, you fall in love with God and you realize what Jesus has done for you, how he's going to provide for you, it just naturally flows. We demonstrate our love through our generosity. Let's bow our heads and pray. If you're online, just would you just take a posture of prayer right now? You don't need to watch the screen. You can just bow your head as well. We'll just all do that right now. You know, God is more interested in raising disciples than raising dollars. And that's true of you. He wants to grow you. God, make us expectant people, make us positive people, but make us generous people. Lord, you demonstrated that so well when you were, when you came as uh, as a servant, just kind of giving everything. Help us likewise to live with open hands. Would you pray to say, God, help me to be a blessable person. Help me not to live like the world lives. Certainly help me not to live the way culture around us lives. Say, God, I want to be somebody that you can entrust blessings to because I know I'm not only supposed to enjoy what I have, but to share. You know, as I mentioned, it's all about, begins with your heart. It's all about the heart issue. If you've not asked Christ into your heart, into your life, then you miss the whole point of it. And it all becomes difficult. It becomes drudgery. It becomes obligation. That's why it always begins.
with letting Christ stir something inside you. And some of you are there right now. You're ready to say, you know what, I want to take that faith step. I encourage you to just pray with me right now. That you, you're saying, yeah, I'm ready to take that step. Would you pray, say, dear God, today, I want to commit my life to you. give you my heart I want to trust in you trust in your promises say forgive me God for my sin for the things I've done wrong give me a fresh start and then help me in this life give me hope some of you need a new dream and you need to be praying that right now we are going to be talking about that in the next, starting next week. Time to dream again. But the truth is, your dream, God wants to resurrect that. He wants to give you a fresh dream. You say, God, help me to let go of the past, the things that hold me back. Heal me from the wounds that just have wrecked me. Let me dream again. And Lord, help me to learn to trust you with my money. Prove my sincerity of my love for you. And that I'm really going to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed with me, if you're online, let me know about it. If you're here in person, I'd love to hear from you on the Connect card that is attached to your program. You can just pull that out right on there, any prayer requests you have. And if you prayed with me, let me know about this. Yeah, I prayed with you, Pastor Andy. I think there's a box there you can check on the way as you leave. Out, as you leave, There's a place for you to drop that in there if you want to, uh, if, you, if you felt like the Lord was prompting you to give and you want to give through a check course, same way. You can just drop it in there or give it at the information desk. Now, we have step four today. Now, normally we say, hey, if you've taken steps one, two, and three in growth track, we want to see you there, and we do. But listen, some of you are starting to come back uh, after a year away because of COVID. And so you're kind of a little displaced, and you're wondering, hey, how do I get back in to the life of the church? Just, you don't, if you've already taken growth track, you don't have to take one, two, and three. Just step right in today, right after the service. It's only a few minutes long, and we'll help you get right back in. We'd love to have you in there. Here's some ways to give. I already mentioned it earlier, vineyardchurch.com. And if you want to give towards our elevator, just do uh, give online. It's in the upper right-hand corner, and then capital projects. Uh, Also, uh, there's texting and check all those things. Would you stand with me? I want to uh, close in prayer as we go into our final song. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you have stirred up in our hearts. We want to be able to give back to you, not just financially, but with our whole hearts and our whole lives. And so, Lord, we want to sing to you in Jesus' name. Let's sing together.